Good morning and welcome to today's session. I would like to introduce today's moderator, Karina Wiebold. She is an economist with the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development Research and Analysis. Today's session will be recorded and available on the FNSB Community Research Quarterly website. If you have any questions throughout the panelist discussion, please use the raise your hand feature to do so. Thank you and please take it away, Karina. All right, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate being here. Like, uh, like I was just introduced, my name is Karina Wiebold, and I'm an economist with the State Department of Labor and Re uh, Workforce Development in the Research and Analysis section. And I am here with two of my colleagues today, Neil Freed in Anchorage and Sarah Teal here in Juneau with me. And um, they're both economists here with the state of Alaska, and we are looking forward to talking to you a little bit about some of the interesting issues that have been coming up uh, as a result of the pandemic. So we're going to be talking about oil and gas. We're going to be talking about um, inflation and we're going to be talking about supply chain issues and I'm going to be moderating and um, Stephanie is going to be keeping an eye on chat. So what we'd like to do here because these subjects are all interrelated um, and kind of complicated, if you have questions as we're working through, put your hand up um, and then Stephanie can bring that to my attention and we'll go ahead and answer questions to the best of our abilities as we're working through this. And we'll have time at the end for a little bit of question as well. So um, don't feel like you have to hop in if you're not ready, we can always cover some stuff at the end. And I am going to share my screen and get going on our presentation. Just one second there. Okay, um, would somebody be able to confirm to me that you can see the PowerPoint presentation? We can see it. Okay, wonderful. All right, I probably should have had this up when I was doing my introduction earlier, but um, one of the things I'd like to bring to your attention is that um, you can contact us. We have, um, it's the email address is our first name dot last name at alaska.gov. And then you can get to our website, which is laborstats.alaska.gov um, anytime. And that is a real wealth of information. We have all of our trends articles, current and historical going back to the 70s online. And um, we also have a lot of our data. So unemployment in, uh, rate, the job numbers, any of those statistics that you might be interested in, you can find on our website. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about this morning is the oil industry. And Sarah Teal comes to us um, via Fairbanks, actually. We got her recruited down here to Juno to work with us. But prior to that, she was living and working in Fairbanks. And she even attended a grad school up there in Fairbanks. So Sarah's got some good Fairbanks roots, as do Neil and I. Um, and we're all excited to be talking to you guys today. Sarah, can you let me know when you want me to change um, slides? But otherwise, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, no problem. Thank you. I think you can hear me. Hello, ev everyone, and good morning. Thank you for tu tuning in. So I am going to be talking to you a bit about Alaska's oil industry with a brilliant cartoon there that Kar Kar Karina found, and our oil prices have fallen, and they've been having a hard time getting up until recently. Okay, Karina, how about the next slide? All right, so I, we are going to take a quick look at what's been going on with oil prices over the past few years. I'm sure a lot of you know that oil prices are generally very volatile, and 2020 was the most volatile year in oil prices ever. It's the biggest change that the oil patch has ever seen, and you can see it here. Um, this graph here is the price of oil per, per barrel for that month. And we can see here when COVID hit in February and March of 2020, when, when the prices fell significantly. And what's interesting about the oil market is that we had several things going on at the same time. So as everyone knows, when we had our shut, shutdowns, people stopped driving, we stopped flying, and our demand for um, oil just dropped. And so prices fell. But at the same time, producers were still producing oil, and so supply kept coming in, and we actually got to a point where our supply of oil was hitting our uh, capacity to actually s s store it, and that also brought prices down, too. 
Um, the third thing that was going on in the oil market at the same time, it actually kind of pre predates it by about a month, was um, what was going on with OPEC Plus. And I've often equated OPEC with sort of like high, high school. There's just drama going on every week. And at this particular time, there was a price war between a Russia and Saudi Ar Arabia over who was going to have the, the greater market share in Asia. And so they were pumping out oil, trying to bring price down to drive the other one out. And so we had this trifecta of events happening and it just made prices plummet. Ever since then, though, we have had increases very slow. And then, of course, as our economy started to open up, prices went up higher because we've been seeing more demand. People are driving more. We are flying more. We are buying more goods, which requires transportation, which requires oil. We've also been having some complications in our natural gas a market, which has spilled over into, in, into oil. And that's all I have. How about the next slide? Excellent. Sarah, before we move on, I want to say two things. One, I wanted to um, tell our audience that um, one of the things that makes Sarah Teal so particularly um, a great, great asset for RNA is that she's not only an economist with some good Alaska roots and some time here, but she also in her former life worked as a petroleum engineer. So she really does yeah. understand, this, understand this industry a lot more than um, a lot of us do from very much a different perspective. So um, thank you, Sarah, for bringing your expertise with you to us here. And then the other thing that I wanted to bring up here is just a kind of a question for you. I'm looking at this chart and April of 2020 had a pretty low um, cost there. It was like 17 bucks a barrel. At some point, I remember there was at least a couple of days where we went negative. Is that the case? And how is that even a possibility? <laughs> it did. I want to say for about what a week, maybe it was a while back, but um, I, the oil markets are very complicated. And basically what happened was we had so much oil on the market at the time. And then there were some uh, termination of contracts in the futures market and it caused the prices to plunge into the negative range. And what that actually means is that they had so much actual oil that you would have to pay somebody to take it off of your shoulders. Isn't that a strange condition to find ourselves in? Yeah, I don't think anybody ever thought that that would happen. And before we move off of this slide, I just wanted to um, say something too, which is that I was writing an article recently about the fishing industry. And one mm -hmm. of the things that I found in my research for that was that we had hit an, an interesting little price point this year with the commodity prices of two of our favorite thing, king salmon and oil barrels. And they had reached this equilibrium that we haven't been at for quite a while. So I believe that it was like in August yeah, yeah, I think it was in July or August, probably July, the price um, of each was just about $75. So the average sized king salmon at the going price and a barrel of oil were equal. So it's kind of an interesting Alaska only metric, but I thought that was of note. Okay. I'm going to move on to your next slide, Sarah. Perfect. All right, so here is a quick and dirty slide over with um, crude oil production from the North Slope. And, and this is from the very beginning in the 70s all the way up until, I don't think it was last month, I think it may have been before, but um, you can see here where we had a ramp up up until the late 80s where, where we hit peak and we've been declining ever since. And, and, and this is absolutely what an oil a reservoir does. You will peak up and then decline. And at this point, uh, what we focus on or what producers focus on is how to flatten that. And you can see in the um, early 2000s, there were some projects that came on and it sort of flattened there. And we've had some flattening the past few years. Um, one of the ma major players now up on the North Slope is, of course, Hillcorp. And they're they are very good at extracting more oil from a reservoir without doing more drilling. And they do things by optimizing subsurface and surface equipment to make sure that they're um, a, a working at e efficient rates. And they, and they also employ a lot of what is called EOR, which is enhanced oil recovery techniques. And so whenever you hear a term like a water flooding or polymer flooding, that's what that means. 
And I guess I'll just point out here because I just find it interesting is that you can see um, you can't quite tell on this graph, but every summer we have a fall in production, and that's for two reasons. Number one, the, um, the summertime is when the producers will take wells offline so they can do maintenance work, but also because of the conditions on the North Slope, all of the equipment there is designed to, to produce at optimally at a very cold temperatures, and so when it warms up, they don't produce as much. And I'm ready for the next slide. So now we'll transition into what's been going on with employment in the oil industry. Um, you can see here in um, the late 2014 or so, we had a peak at 15,300 oil industry jobs. There was a, a price decline in 2015, 2016, and then we see the number of jobs go down. It kind of stay, stabilized some. And we had some activity in 2019 into early 2020. And then, of course, you can see when COVID hit, this big drop as the price fell. And we went down to approximately 6,600. We had about a 30% drop in, in the number of oil jobs in Alaska from pre-COVID until about now. And the one thing that I do want to point, actually two things I want to point out here, is that the number of oil industry jobs is not always proportional to what's been going on with the oil price. So just because oil price goes up doesn't necessarily mean that we will increase the number of jobs that we, we have. It's a much more complicated relationship. Um, and it's also the only in industry that we have here that has not recovered very well since um, COVID happened. And next one, perfect. So we often are asked um, if an Alaskan is working on the North Slope, where do they actually live? And this is a um, table here that you 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 can see. It's got the a number of North Slope borough workers and where they live. And this is from 2019. We get this information from the PFD. And so in 2019, 36.2% of um, Alaskan oil workers lived in Matsu. And in second place was 31.9% in Anchorage and then Kenai with 23%. And in fourth place is Fairbanks at 4.8%. So here we can see that almost all of them live somewhere, well, south of where you are. And what's interesting too is that when you looked at this from 2011, the rankings changed. The the um, uh, most workers lived in um, Anchorage. In second place was Kenai. Third place was Matsu, and then Fairbanks was still in fourth place. All right, next graph or um, slide. Excuse me. We also get questions on how many of the oil and gas workers are residents and how many are not. And here we have a, a slide or a. Um, uh, graph that shows from two, 2009 until 2019. And generally, we are going from about 28% to about 37% of oil and gas workers are non-residents. Um, this is significantly higher than what we usually see with the state. I believe it's around 20%. Karina, is that right? That is correct. It's usually right, right. between 18 and 20 Yes, and there's several a, a, a reasons for for this. Um, one is because the technical ex expertise that is required for oil and gas workers can be specific, and it can also be difficult to find in our Alaska labor market. the The other issue is that it is not exactly optimal uh, working conditions there. So you have two weeks on and two weeks off. Not everybody can actually do that. And, you know, you uh, you are on the, the uh, North Slope. That is a difficult place uh, with that cold. Sarah, can I bring up a couple extra things? Um, Absolutely. Looking at this, um, the residency of Alaska workers is one of my favorite topics. I used to get to work on this report, and so it's near and dear to my heart. The next one covering 2020, the first um, year of the pandemic, is going to be coming out in January, and I would just encourage everybody to take a look at that. It's going to be really interesting because, like Sarah said, a lot of these numbers um, and percentages for the non-residents kind of stays fairly static over time, um, but 
2020 is going to be a whole different year. Uh, we didn't have as many resident workers and we've had a lot of job loss. So it's very interesting to take a look at that, but it's not quite out yet. The other thing that I wanted to kind of identify here is that um, when you look at this residency chart, you're going to see a couple things. One is, although I said that a lot of the um, the percent of non-residents doesn't change very much. For oil and gas, when you look at it, it kind of has, you know, it's been going around in the 30s, but it's kind of been bouncing around more than some of our other industries do. But what was really interesting here is if you look at 16, 17, and 18, those drops in total employment really hit both residents and non-residents about the same um, as far as like the number of job losses in those two categories. But overall, we lost a lot of jobs. And um, I mean, folks probably remember back to 2016, 17, and 18. Those were the years of Alaska's longest recession. And we had only just started to pull out of that in 2019, which you can see in these oil. <laughs> gas numbers. And the recession from 2016, 17, and 18, that really uh, was precipitated again by oil prices. So oil prices have a lot to do with how Alaska's total economy is doing. So thanks for letting me jump in. Those are a couple of things I just wanted to say there. No problem. All right. Oop. Okay. I next guess slide. that's it. I saw the next ah. slide and it is mine. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say about oil and gas, Sarah? No, I don't think so, unless anybody has a question. Let's see. I don't see any currently. I do not see any. Okay. Great. Um, Neil, can you talk just for a second about what happened with oil and gas um, jobs in Anchorage? I know that you, um, Anchorage is in a different situation there because you've got uh, more of the corporate headquarter types. Am I, did something yeah. happen? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah. I mean, what happened is, you know, Anchorage, because BP pulled out and, or was sold, um, they um, sold their assets to Hillcore and Hillcore uh, uses a considerably smaller workforce that in these declines um, and job losses, um, the job losses were on a percent basis, even larger um, for Anchorage and they were um, statewide. Uh, and it's gotten considerably smaller. I mean, the, the numbers that we just got today on, on the worker counts that um, uh, Sarah was talking about, and that's an important distinction. The, the first data we looked at employment, those was a job count. And those most recent numbers that she shared with us on where these workers live, that was a worker count and slightly different. And, and, and that number is usually higher. Um, it used to be, and uh, Sarah pointed this out, and I think it's pretty interesting, and we'll have to look at it in greater detail, how that workforce has shifted considerably um, in the state and where those folks live. Um, uh, and I, I would like to just also say in the longer run, I think oil prices are probably the best predictor of where employment will eventually go. Are you talking about employment for oil and gas? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. And as we've kind of noted, it drives a lot of other things in the state just as a function of the fact that we get a lot of our state revenue from oil and gas, or at least we did until the last couple of years when we've shifted to draws from um, the permanent fund reserve and, account, and, I believe. Um, well, so. Maybe one other last detail is when we look at the number of people live, working in Prudhoe Bay today, it's equivalent to where it was back in 2005. So these job losses, you know, we're getting down to levels that we've, you know, rarely seen before. It's a much, much smaller industry than we had seen in, in some of the previous years. Yeah. Really and I, do, I do actually have one thing I do want to add um, that is um relevant now is that for publicly traded oil companies, they are not investing in their capital um, programs very much right now. Um, they are getting pressure from their shareholders to work on their balance sheets. So they are not spending as much money on their capital projects, which means we're not investing as much as they would have. And there could be consequences to it as in production and possibly employment. Mm -hmm. 
Sarah, can you talk to us for just a second about when oil and gas jobs uh, flattened out? We lost for long, we lost oil and gas jobs longer than we lost other uh, sectors, and then they started to increase some. Can you tell people kind of like where we are now? Could you go back to that slide? Mm -hmm. Here, nope, not that one. Nope. Yes, there we are. So. Your question was where we are right now with our employment? Yes. Okay, basically, um, sorry, Sarah, I think I made this a little clunky of a question. I just really wanted people to understand that while most industries lost the bulk of their employment um, immediately when the pandemic hit, oil and gas kept losing for quite a while longer. So it really didn't stop uh, like declining until late 2020. Um, and then after that, we'd, we've seen some very mild increases in employment. Yes, yeah, some of that's because the projects take time to wind down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sarah, what do you think next year is going to look like in a nutshell? Do you see any increases in price or uh, employment? Hmm. I think oil price is going to stay up. Probably in the, I'm thinking 70 to $80 range, um, but we never really know because some something could happen that will, uh, will affect it dramatically. And I think employment will go up, but I don't think that we're going to recover all of those losses next year. Okay. Thank you so much. Last chance if anyone has questions on oil and gas. Otherwise, we're going to move on to supply chain and we can always circle back at the end to take any other questions. So I get to talk about supply chain, and I thought this was really fascinating, so I'm glad that I got to. Um, so this cartoon here kind of summarizes it. Right now, our supply chain is in a little bit of a jumble. And I thought it might be kind of fun to start by stepping back and being like, okay, supply chain. We've been hearing that a ton in the news. It's getting thrown around all, all over the place, but what really is the supply chain? You know, what does that mean to us? And the way that we can think about it is... Um, you know, stuff starts in the ground. It's either mined or it's grown. The raw materials are collected somewhere. They're brought somewhere for um, like manufacturing. They're well stored in a warehouse, brought in for manufacturing, turned into some things, probably brought somewhere else, again, via transportation for um, like assembly. And then they are going to be warehoused and then they are going to be transported again to the end consumer. So we have situations where almost everything that we use, wear, eat, et cetera, well, we'll slow down on eating because whole foods are different, but um, things go through a lot of, of life cycles, a lot of steps in their life cycle as they're getting to where they're going. And we are in a really integrated economy worldwide where we're all participating together in this movement of goods and materials. And so um, the supply chain really has to do with like every step of those changes when something changes hands. So where does it start? Then who has it? Then who has it? Then who has it? And ultimately, where is it going? And how does it get to the consumer? So there's two big issues that have contributed to um, some of the issues that we have right now in supply chain. Actually, there's three issues. One is the disruption, and what, the other side of it is how our supply chain has evolved in the last 20 or 30 years. And so there's two things that we want to talk about there. One is this concept of just in time, and then the other one is globalization in general. And um, so we're going to just take a nice little look at that. Okay, so we are connected, as I mentioned, the whole world is connected. And because of the way that we are connected and because of this, the adoption of this just-in-time philosophy, we don't have a lot of room for large-scale disruptions. Small things can happen um, or isolated events can happen and they will show up in prices or in uh, supply in different areas for different consumers. But what's interesting here is that COVID has managed to hit everybody in some way and almost everything in some way. So instead of like um, back, I think in 2011, when we had, there was some frost down in really prime coffee growing areas and um, coffee prices went way up when the supply went down because that year there just wasn't very much of it. That was really very episodic and it was isolated to just that one uh, product and it was over soon. Um, another one 
Oh, I don't need to run through examples, but there's examples where there's been just one little disruption that's occurred. Uh, but what we see happening, obviously, in COVID is a sudden disruption worldwide, hitting everything, but in slightly different ways. So, you know, we've got our raw materials, our components, our assembly, that all, because of these things generally take place in the lowest cost area, are going to be done in one place and then move to the next place and move to the next place. So that puts a lot of pressure on shipping. And, you know, we do have a, a constantly growing uh, air shipping industry globally, uh, nationally, and particularly in Alaska, it's been growing uh, in we've had more and more freight going to the Anchorage airport. And I could ask Neil in a minute to say something about the increase in Anchorage freight, but it's a, it's a big international freight uh, hub. Um, but okay. Where I was going with that is that um, that kind of shipping and trucking is big too, but shipping by air and truck are um, not the primary ways that we get most of our goods across the globe. That really has to do with container ships and ports. So usually um, like getting things to the port is the first step of getting it on a truck, but we're always in a situation where you know, things basically originate or have been moved at some point in their production heavily with marine traffic. And that's been a huge issue with uh, the supply chain problems that we're seeing now is transportation problems. So, um, and then I said earlier that the entire world has been affected, but at slightly different times, different countries have had their peaks in their valleys of COVID at different times, and they have different rates of uh, vaccination and access to vaccines. And so when all these little pieces come from all these different places, to manufacture the final product, you've got to have all of it. You know, it doesn't work if you have 95% of the things that you need. And so we really have a lot of issues with being able to bring the whole product together and also being able to get the product to the end consumers. So and then I want to talk a little bit about this idea of, I think I'm going to probably pronounce it wrong, but I'm going to say Kanban. And that's kind of a Japanese logistics approach that was pioneered in the Toyota factories. But basically what it does is it says, let's not tie up our resources, our, our capital or our labor in things that aren't actually moving quickly toward getting the product to the consumer. So basically it was like, let's not order more stuff than we need. Let's order what we need when we need it and assume that it's going to get there quickly. And let's not work on things that we're going to work on and then warehouse. Let's work on the thing that's going to be going out. So a real lean turnover. Don't order the supplies before you need them. Don't make the things that you don't need yet and focus on, you know, getting the current job done. That works really, really well. Um, when everything in the entire system is flowing. But what we found, of course, in COVID is that there were monkey wrenches in the system throughout. And so it that concept of uh, being lean and mean and working on receiving a signal that something is needed or ready and then going to get it with your response as opposed to setting things up in a, a little bit more of like a overly prepared method uh, has, has changed the availability of um, some of the raw materials that are necessary and then the end products, because they're not just sitting somewhere waiting for us. They need to be made kind of initially for demand. So like I said, it's really an efficient method of production and distribution. And yet at the same time, it's not fail safe. So we found in this situation that because there's a lack of redundancies and where people can get these materials or how they're going to be shipping them or, you know, where they're being um, manufactured and assembled and the reduction in wait times, then once things start to be like gummed up, then the, we don't have the ability to continue to get the whole machinery moving. So that's kind of it. It works when everything else is working, but it doesn't work as well when we have issues and COVID was a big issue. And it was a, I read somewhere that these were the glo biggest global supply chain um, issues that we have seen outside of uh, war. Like, and we're talking war time, not just like small wars, but big wars. All right, so I pulled this from um, from the White House. Actually, had an interesting blog on supply chain issues, and so this is survey based information, and it's asking businesses in the U.S. 
if they've had supplier delays, if they've had basically supply chain issues in their business. And one of the things that's kind of interesting here is you can see when you're looking at the percent that they say that they've had problems, it's really heavy on manufacturing, construction, retail, wholesale, and food. So when you think about those, those are all the ones that need ingredients from other places. You know, manufacturing needs the raw materials and raw goods. Um, construction, construction is a really interesting one. Actually, I can talk about that for just a second. It's not going to be any surprise to people who were paying attention this summer, but uh, lumber prices went up exponentially. That's a good example. So uh, let's see. I think it was. Uh, I'm going to get the linear foot price right, but I think the quantity wrong. But the linear foot price for a certain quantity of wood was about seventeen hundred dollars, and that kind of equated to a two thousand square foot house costing about seven thousand in lumber. So let's just think about that normal size house, seven thousand in lumber pre pandemic. We got to the summer, and the same amount of wood was going to be costing $27,000. That had some to do with disruptions in lumber production. It had some to do with transportation issues. But that's what you can see here in construction. And those increases in the cost of producing uh, goods and services, including homes, drives the price up. And that's when we can start to see some of the inflationary pressures. And that's something that Neil's going to talk about. So manufacturing, construction, retail trade, and wholesale trade are all places that we've seen a pretty serious impact. I thought this was kind of a fun cartoon to stop and look at, right? I want an Xbox, chip shortage. Okay, let's talk about the ship, the chips shortage. This one's really interesting as well. There's two primary kinds of chips. There's a larger one and there's a smaller one and they have slightly different uses. Um, I'm not an expert in this. Maybe there's some listeners out there who are and I hope I get this mostly right, but um, there was a chip shortage or there is a chip shortage which has resulted in a cascade and myriad of issues. And so the chip shortage kind of started out with like the origin, okay? So auto manufacturers need chips for all sorts of different components in their vehicles. And they reduced the initial um, orders for chips really quick in 2020 when the pandemic hit, believing that they were going to have a much decreased demand for vehicles. And that's something that we saw in rental cars too. They had an anticipation that we weren't going to use a lot of rental cars in the next year or two, and there were very few ordered. And then the price of rental cars to consumers really skyrocketed this last summer as people started to, to vacation and travel more. And that was kind of an unanticipated uh, consumer response according to the plans of the rental car company. So the chips, there's two different kinds. They're basically needed in everything. Um, the de demand for cars and chips is up, but the demand for chips in all other consumer goods basically is up too. We're starting to put chips in all sorts of different things. So there was a reduction in the number of chips that auto manufacturing was ordering, but there was an increase in the number of chips that um, could potentially be used in other manufacturing. And then there was a fire in one of the chip, one of the primary chip factories. So that was a big deal. They're expensive. It's not easy to get these things online quickly. So when we had some issues there um, with a decrease in the production of chips and then a decrease in the ability to produce them because of the fire, et cetera, and the closures in factories when COVID was really just starting to erupt. We had a shortage of chips, but then there was an increase in demand for all these household goods as people were staying home and spending more time at home. And they said, okay, then the demand for chips in these other goods for manufacturing went up, resulting in a shortage. Now there's not enough for the manufactured goods and there's not enough for the cars. So that's a little bit of what the chip shortage looked like. Um, this next one for van shoes, say a factory slowdown, you know, that's happening all over the globe right now. Um, factories have reduced workers, um, you know, due, due to various concerns with COVID in different areas. Sometimes they're closed, sometimes they're just at reduced capacity. And some of them have had a really hard time restarting after closing for COVID, either for their own direct COVID concerns or um, because there wasn't demand for their goods immediately. So. 
that's kind of that. Raw materials for brass dolls, that's when we're kind of talking about um, the fact that so much of what we have is coming from uh, different countries. And so these the countries that are initially supplying the raw materials for these goods, when they have issues bringing those raw materials to market, then there's going to be issues that cascade all the way up to our uh, consumers. This one on Lululemon, I thought was pretty funny, a bottleneck at the port. The bottlenecks at the ports have been a really big deal. Um, I was looking at some of the information on the port information on the ports. And, um, you know, I think that people have heard in the news that there's been a lot of ships that are just kind of floating out at sea that don't have an opportunity to get to their ports or don't have an opportunity to get their uh, cargo unloaded in a time sensitive way. And so one example that I was looking at is this November, there were 71 container ships just a couple of days ago anchored out of LA. 71 ships full of consumer goods anchored and waiting. And when I flew to Seattle in September, I saw a great deal of that uh, in that area as well. So they're just hanging out and waiting. Um, there's been some port closures. Uh, there was one in uh, China in August when a single COVID case ended up resulting in the closure of the a pretty important port for several days, which added to, you know, this like backlog of transportation pressure on other areas or to the ships had to wait. Um, so I was saying there were 71 container ships that were anchored out of LA uh, the other day. That was down from their peak, which was 86, only a couple of days before that. But guess what's normal? Zero. Zero waiting out there and anchored in the bay is what's normal. So this is a really radical increase in, in issues with bottlenecks. And then once the goods have actually gotten into the port, then they need to be um, offloaded from the, from the ships, and they also need to be trucked somewhere. And there's a trucker shortage at this point as well. So there's issues on every level of uh, getting through the transportation nodes. So at the end of this, the kid says, but I kind of wasted my opportunity to be a naughty this year since I can't have anything I want anyway. Enjoy that. There's there's kind of two things that spurred the initial, uh, in, well, the increase in demand in all of these consumer goods that have also resulted in some pressure through the supply chain. And that is kind of twofold. One is that uh, Alaskans and Americans were at home a great deal in the last two years compared to what we had been in the past, right? So people are working from home, they're isolating, they're staying separate. We're not spending money eating out. We're not spending money uh, at bars. We're not spending money at movie theaters. We're not going on vacation. So all of that stuff has been restricted, which means there's an increase in personal income. It's actually record at that point. Increase in personal income at the same time that we received, uh, the general populations received three rounds of stimulus payments, which also greatly increased um, our I, I'll call it like consumer availability of capital. We had some money, so we started spending it on things that were um, making our kitchens more efficient, that were making our home offices more efficient, that were making our homes more comfortable, that were keeping our kids entertained, et cetera. So there was an, a decrease in the supply of goods because of what was happening globally. At the same time, there was an increase in the demand for a lot of goods because of the way that we were spending our time and money. I thought this was a fun one to bring up too. I don't know if you guys remember back in March of just this year, we were looking at the Suez Canal uh, closure basically here. What happened was this mega container ship, bigger than you know the average container ship, was coming through here, heavily laden, high winds, got turned, and it was stuck there in the Suez Canal for like six days. And what is really remarkable about this is that this little canal is the the primary and shortest way to get goods from Asia up into uh, Europe. And so it was, it was a real crunch. There were a lot of people who were trying to get through here and the ever given ended up blocking it and keeping quite a lot of, um, of freight from moving for a while. And so that caused a cascade of back issues afterwards. Um, couple interesting things about that. One is that there are estimates that this closure of the Suez Canal as a result of the boat um, cost global trade as much as $10 billion. And I really don't have a good understanding of breakdown of like how exactly it costs global trade $10 million, but those are the reported numbers and that's a pretty big amount. And then the other thing that's kind of funny and incidental about this is just 
two days ago, three days ago, the Ever Given made its first successful uh, crossing through the Suez Canal since its like world famous failure. So um, it's whatever. I feel like that marks something, but it's probably not super important. All right, a little ending cartoon here. All the container ships from Asia are backed up. We might have to buy American-made products. And, you know, the the joke here really is just that the supply chain issues have really um, illustrated some of the bigger picture problems with globalization in events where everything isn't working optimally. And so if we do buy things that are closer to home, at least the chances of... Uh, some of those supply chain issues and particularly transportation issues are somewhat mitigated. So um, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions or anything they want to tip in? Yes, good. I see Robin. Robin, you want to unmute yourself? For the um, increase in personal income that happened because people weren't spending money by staying at home and then the stimulus how broad was that? Was that something that just happened in certain sectors with like a professional class where people could work from home or, or was that, did that affect the economy universally? That is a really good question, Robin. I don't have um, like really specific data about exactly how that was broken down, but we do have information that white collar workers were definitely predominantly the ones that were capable of working remotely, who were allowed to work remotely and whose work was appropriate for it. So it was more white collar workers who were working from home um, for sure. But at the same time for the rise in personal income, that was nearly universal because everyone wasn't going out as much as they used to, and everyone almost received a stimulus. So those two things were universal. So even if you were on the lower scale of, um, lower end of the income scale, personal income was higher than it had been for basically everyone. Neil, you've done a lot of research on that. Do you want to clarify or hop in? No, I mean, I think you're, you know, what you said is completely right. I mean, I, I you know, I, it really affected everyone and income across the board pretty much increased quite dramatically. Another weird thing, you know, typically in recessions, you know, income drops, especially when you lose as many jobs as we lost because most income comes from employment. But in this case, and I suspect it's the only time it has ever happened where income per capita income rose pretty significantly, especially last year, but even for the first two quarters of this year, um, in spite of the fact of those job losses because of all those transfers um, that were made and savings. Um, and, you know, the stock market did quite well during much of this, the real estate market. So people had that extra income as well. Yeah, thank you. And I kind of muddied two things together. I was talking about like how much more money we had available to spend, but um, your income doesn't go up if you aren't spending money at bars and restaurants, just your available spending. So I should be clear there. And then um, for some folks, the unemployment insurance compensation was a little bit higher than what they had been paid back when they were working. And so we saw people, even at that level, um, more of like the minimum wage level, having more money available to them than they had in the past. So with that, I think, unless we have any other pressing questions, um, I'm just going to say that the increase in money available to us and our, that results in the increase in demand for these goods and services, and that, coupled with their um, restriction in the amount of the availability of these service or these goods that we want, has resulted in inflation, which means that Neil is going to take it away. <laughs> well, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm not sure what it is. It's kind of dark still, but um, I'm going to just, I've been, you know, looking at inflation for a very, very long time. Inflation as a topic of interest has been actually not there for a very long time because we basically had relatively low inflation, both in this country and in this state for the last 10 or 15 years. You know, I think the average inflation rate for the last 10 years or more was about 2%. Um, and you could always guess if someone called you and asked you, what do you think it's going to be? It's at ah, 2 or 3% and it would be fine. Now, despite the fact that it didn't create a lot of news, 
the, the, the statistics that generate the inflation rate uh, are probably the most used economic statistic out there in a very practical way, um, year in and year out. Um, we use them for child support payments. We use them in wage negotiations, wage contracts. People use them um, to just get a feel for where they think maybe wages and, and where their wages or employer thinks their workers' wages should go. The permanent fund is adjusted each year, inflation proof by um, inflation. Social Security um, is adjusted each year. In Alaska, the minimum wage is adjusted. So it has real world effects. Um, and lots of contracts are written. Uh, and there are probably some people out there um, that are listening to this that have contracts um, tied to um, the rate of inflation. Now, in Alaska, we have what's called the you know, the, the Urban Alaska Consumer Index, Consumer Price Index, which really just, it's only been called that for the last, I think, three or four years. Before that, it was the Anchorage Consumer Price Index, um, but they broadened it some uh, and are taking um, samples from elsewhere in the urban areas of elsewhere in the state um, and now calling it the Urban Alaska Index. The only other urban index like this is in Hawaii. Um, there are about 31 places in the country where we measure inflation, uh, and Alaska is the smallest, the smallest population. Usually, they're pretty large urban areas. Um, uh, in fact, they got rid of Portland's, I think, last year. Um, so we're sort of lucky to have this indicator. Now, just a few other things about the cost of living and what sometimes people confuse is that when we talk about the consumer price index or inflation, we're talking about the difference in the cost of living between two different geographic places, like how much more does it cost to live in Bethel than it does in Fairbanks, for example. And that's not what we're talking about here. All we're talking about is what has the change in the cost of living been in a particular place for a particular market basket of goods. And this market basket of goods theoretically measures the what the average consumer spends their money on. And for the Alaska Urban Index, you have different weights because we spend more money on certain things than others. For example, for housing, we estimate about 42% of our consumer dollars for housing, or 16% is for food and beverages, or 15% is for transportation, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't vary that much. Uh, you know, another thing, um, so it's, it's really just looking at the change in the cost of living. The other thing is um, we have very little control um, and very little of it is locally affected. Most of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is affected by national and international um, trends. And that certainly is the case now. And we'll see that in the numbers. Um, you know, uh, the price of oil, we don't, that's not determined in Alaska. The price of food is not, you know, the changing in the price of food, the price of food might be, but the change in price of food is a national um, indicator. Price of almost everything is, is not locally determined, the change in the price of things. Are, housing can be somewhat localized. Um, now, one other thing in the practical use of this index is there's really two of them. There's a consumer price index for all urban consumers for urban Alaska. Uh, and that's the, the, the one that we hear the most about because it's the most inclusive. There's also the consumer price index for wage earners and clerical workers, which is really a subset of that and is hardly ever used and can largely be ignored. Now, if people are using the CPI, it's really important in your language, if you have some kind of contract, um, that you get, you're very specific, specific about which CPI from a geographic standpoint you're using, what timing you use. The CPI comes out every other month for urban Alaska, nationally it comes out every month. Um, so you, if you wanted to look at a year's change, you would have to look like the most recent one that we have is for October of 1920, I mean, 2021, and compared to October of 2020. But 
I would suggest in most cases, you'd want to go to an annualized rate. You'd have to wait till December or January, and we'd get the inflation rate for um, 2021. Um, uh, and, and it's also you want to specify whether you're using a CPIU or a CPIW, because we remember, there's always two sides to this contract. And if you're not specific, it could cause, you know, some problems. Um, and that's just all sort of practical stuff. But I've seen it. I've seen people um, in, in significant conflict because they're interpreting it differently. So you have to, you want to be very specific if you're actually using this index. Let's go to the, the next slide. Um, uh, Karina, uh, this is, you know, it's, it is fascinating, actually. I, I think it got really fascinating last year. For the first time ever, um, we experienced deflation um, in uh, 2020. That's never happened before. This index has basically been around since the 1960s up here in Alaska. And we actually went down because demand dropped so much um, for a lot of goods and services that prices actually fell some, not a lot, um, but some. And that's to some extent contributed to this giant increase because of the base um, in 2021. But, you know, I was talking about how usually our index is pretty similar to the national index. Nationally, um, the national index for 2021 from October of 2020 to October 2021, which is the most recent we have for Alaska, nationally it was 6.2%, almost identical um, with our index. Um, but you can see that prior to that, um, the index was very low. I mean, there were some years where we had basically close to zero um, uh, inflation. Uh, it was an unusual long period. But let's move to the next slide to just look at some of the details um, on this, because I think there's there's some, you know, everyone thinks everything's getting a lot more expensive, and that's just not quite true. There's certain things that are contributing um, to this index more than others, and some of them are, it's quite interesting. I don't think there are any big surprises here. You know, um, Sarah was talking about the collapse in oil prices last year. Um, I actually saw a gas station last year where the gallon of gas dropped below $2 a gallon. That was a, didn't last very long. There was only one station I saw that in. But um, but we know what prices have since then come back. Um, the whole vehicle thing, um, Karina was talking about, it, and it's really affected the price of automobiles. Um, especially used um, vehicles. Um, but let's let's remember that most of us don't go out and buy, you know, cars every year. Um, those are purchases that only happen, you know, well, in my case, not very often at all. So in, in many cases that, that and this one does affect me because I am looking for a used car, but uh, for most people, it doesn't affect them at all. But it's, I mean, the drama there is, is pretty dramatic. Food is also seeing a pretty significant increase um, in contributor because it's got a pretty heavy weight. Um, you know, it represents about 6% or 16% of our purchasing power. And then you see the other ones. Now, clothing looks, you know, kind of mundane, but actually clothing has been deflationary for many, many years because of the competition, the international competition for clothing. And most of you probably noticed you know, I bought a parka in Fairbanks in 1973 at for, I think it was $50, and I can still buy a parka, and, um, and then that park was made in the United States. That park, you can still buy a parka, maybe not a great one, but you can still buy one for $50. I mean, clothing, I mean, it's unusual to see an increase in clothing, and you can see housing, um, and remember, and housing, a lot of people are surprised by that um, because they're going, they're hearing all these stories. Well, you know, my house, you know, it's sold for 20,000 more asking price or it's 100,000 more than it was 10 years ago. Remember, most of us are not buying new houses um, every year. It affects a small segment of the population. What really affects population is the, what the insurance, the energy costs, the rent if you're a renter, et cetera. And the most sort of the interesting thing in this index or is Medicare, which has been the dominant 
um, sector of our economy where inflation has been very high over time. It's been the biggest contributor, one of the biggest contributors to inflation for a very long time, but that was not the case this last year. And of course, there are other things that um, are displacing that. Let's um, go to the next slide, which is the last slide. Just to remind folks, and you know, of course you have to be older to remember this. I remember this very, very well. In fact, I was an economist for a number of these years, but this is not the first time that we have seen higher inflation um, or high inflation. Um, you know, it got almost to 14% in 1975. And what's interesting about this is that these were some of the best years in Alaska's economy. Um, remember, we were building the pipeline in 74, 75, 76, and 77. And then we had the big oil revenue boom in 78, 79, in the 80s until our economy crashed. So, you know, if you listen to some commentators, they think inflation may kill off growth nationally, but that's not necessarily the truth at all. Um, we could have both um, strong growth and inflation. How long is this inflation going to last? You know, I don't think it's going to be over this year. Um, you know, lots of people were saying it was a transitory thing um, initially um, because of the supply chain problems and big increases in demand. Um, but I, I think most people believe that, you know, some of our behavior is going to change as a result. Uh, expectations are also important. Um, my guess is that we will see, you know, higher than average on inflation for probably a number of years, but we don't know. I think the Fed did a forecast just recently and said 6% this year, 4% next year, 2%. But, you know, there's just a huge amount of uncertainty. Trying to predict what inflation is going to do is, um, is very, very difficult. Um, and I think those are all the comments. I don't know if I left anything out. Um, with all the comments I have for um, inflation. Let's see if we have any questions on inflation. And in, in the meantime, I just wanted to ask you, Neil, for clarification on housing. Um, you mentioned that we don't all buy new houses every year. Totally, I totally agree. Um, how do they handle housing within the CPI to uh, adjust for that? So that's not an increase in new housing prices or anything. That's a, it's a different kind of housing concept, right? Yes, but I mean, it could include the increase in, in the price of housing, um, you know, because a certain segment of the population does end up purchasing new housing and, and it costs more. And that would theoretically be, uh, you know, reflected in the CPI. Also rent, of course, increase in rent if, if we're in the environment for increasing rent, which we probably are moving into again because vacancy rates, as we know, did come down. That, and the interesting thing about Alaska for housing prices is for a very long time, um, our housing prices were doing very little, uh, especially after you adjust them for inflation, unlike the rest of the country. But this last year, um, 2021, we've seen a, a significant upward pressure on, on the price of new homes and the price of, well, not just new homes, but the price of uh, um, buying a new home. And also it, it appears that rent is also I'm um, going to start is beginning to increase again as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I would like to take this opportunity. I'm going to scroll back here to the title slide and just see if anyone has any questions or if there's anything that you would like to ask us about these topics while we're all still here. Um, Well, I don't want that to have to last too long. I don't want to make it awkward. So let's uh, let's go ahead and hand it back on over to our friend Stephanie, and she can tie us up. We're actually exactly on time, which is pretty amazing. Hey, yes, on time. Um, thank you. That was a great discussion. Um, the session was recorded and can be found on the FNSB Community Research Quarterly website. It'll be there soon. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us.